Morning, everybody. Morning. Shall we wait uh, one more moment, perhaps, and then, uh, then we'll get started. Let's uh, get started. We've been talking in uh, the last few weeks about uh, major challenges in the modern economy to uh, human well being and sustainable development. Uh, we've talked about uh, last week the challenges of poverty, both absolute and relative poverty. Uh, before that, we talked about uh, the dramatic changes in the world of work and uh, both the promise and the risks that are coming from the disruptions of the labor market, the promise for uh, a even more, uh, more humane uh, use of time uh, and escape from drudgery, uh, but also the possibilities of widening inequalities of income, wealth, and power that could attend to these technological changes. Today, I want to talk about uh, well-being uh, in uh, its uh, broad sense once again, especially how one measures it and how we can link the measurements of well-being to public policy. When we do measure well-being, what do we learn about uh, how societies and economies can be organized to promote well-being? So that's our topic today. Then we will uh, conclude this uh, block of discussion next week with the discussion about sustainable development. Uh, and then we'll turn to some macroeconomic issues, uh, stability and volatility of the economy, unemployment, and the challenges uh, of uh, the macro economy over time. So I will uh, share my screen and start here. So the question for us today is how to measure and to promote well-being. Uh, and uh, I will remind us uh, from the start of our discussions about the eudaimonia or eudaimonic approach to politics and economy. The idea that the purpose of our politics, economy, and ethics should be the good life. The good life, uh, of course, uh, needing to be described, defined, uh, but a life that is fulfilling, uh, a life of thriving for the people in society. And today, in an interconnected world, we should think about that meaning a good life, a thriving life for all people in all parts of the world. Uh, this idea that society is partly of a human creation uh, and uh, that it, the institutions of society should be shaped uh, in order to promote uh, the good life is the central concept of the ancient Greeks, uh, especially with the uh, philosophy beginning with uh, Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle. And eudaimonia, or good spirits, or happiness, or thriving life, uh, was the quest of Socrates uh, in all his inquiries. Uh, it is the purpose of the first uh, politics book uh, of uh, Western civilization, The Republic, written by Plato to ask what would be, how to achieve, I should say, the good life uh, in the city-state, in the polis uh, of uh, Greek uh, civilization. 
a, a city state like Athens or the other city states uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Greek civilization. Uh, this notion of eudaimonia uh, finds, uh, of course, uh, similar themes and approaches with important uh, distinctions as well in uh, religion, uh, in uh, Jewish and Christian uh, thinking. Uh, when Jesus uh, gives the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it is about, uh, we translate it as uh, blessed, but uh, it is uh, beatitude, beatitudo, happiness uh, for uh, people in the coming kingdom of God, how to achieve uh, well-being, beatitudo, uh, and the beatitudes uh, is Christ's message for how to achieve that well-being. In modern times, uh, the idea of a eudaimonic approach to politics and economy is uh, exemplified uh, in utilitarianism. Uh, in Bentham's uh, uh, idea, for example, of promoting the greatest good for the greatest number, uh, an idea that uh, has been uh, debated and refined in many ways during the two centuries since Bentham put forward the idea. But we should think about utilitarianism uh, in some sense uh, as following in the approach of uh, eudaimonia, though with very distinctive uh, ideas that Bentham held, uh, which were not the same as the ancient Greek ideas. Yet the aim of Bentham was to promote uh, happiness, uh, as he called it, or actually, as he called it, utility in the population. So this is the approach that I subscribe to myself, that our role as economists or uh, political scientists or citizens uh, is to think about how our political and economic institutions can best be designed to promote eudaimonia, thriving of the population. And the Greeks, we know, had uh, a number of different schools of thought about eudaimonia. Uh, they shared many ideas and then had many uh, distinctive uh, ideas as well. One uh, shared idea in Greek thought was that eudaimonia has to be achieved by cultivating character, by cultivating personal uh, excellences uh, in thought and in behavior. And in particular, uh, that means uh, uh, cultivating virtues uh, or translated as excellences. And uh, four virtues emphasized by uh, both Plato and Aristotle uh, and Socrates, I should add, uh, uh, are wisdom or good judgment uh, or phronesis in ancient Greek, courage, uh, moderation, and justice. Uh, and these uh, are conceived to be the path to well-being. Think of how different uh, our uh, philosophical outlook is today. When we think about the path to a good life, we might uh, describe uh, prosperity, wealth, and so forth. But we usually don't start with the idea of uh, the good life depending on character. But this is the point of uh, agreement of all of the major Greek uh, philosophies. For Aristotle, uh, who was, uh, if nothing else, a, a pragmatist as well as a magnificent thinker, Aristotle recognized that a good life depended on many things. One was an adequate level of uh, material well being, because Aristotle said if you're poor, if you're hungry, uh, if you're destitute, in practice, you will not be able to achieve 
the good life. And so he was very pragmatic about this, not ascetic or denying material comforts, but saying that a level of material comforts was essential. Aristotle, of course, in uh, the Nicomachean Ethics, stresses friendship as a fundamental part of uh, human well-being uh, and devotes a considerable amount of attention to different kinds of friendship. Uh, Aristotle emphasizes both in the Nicomachean Ethics and in the politics, citizenship uh, as part of one's own formation and as part of a good life to be a citizen who participates in the uh, design and stewardship of the polis. Of course, Aristotle emphasized virtue and uh, argued above all that virtue was to be achieved by a kind of moderation between deficiency and excess. Uh, and so following a middle path of moderation uh, was uh, what uh, Aristotle took to be the right behavior and eventually the right way to form character. Aristotle believed that uh, a good life also was one where there was the possibility of philosophical contemplation. Indeed, at the end of Nicomachean Ethics, when he considers what's the best possible life there could be, it is the life of a philosopher. In other words, he decides that his life is the best possible life imaginable, which is a nice thing after all. Uh, but he believed, uh, along with uh, Plato, uh, that the ability to uh, perceive the truth and the search for the truth was part and parcel of a good life, not only uh, a, a necessary uh, input to a good life, but that the search for truth itself was part of a thriving life. And Aristotle emphasized, especially in putting the politics together with the ethics, the two volumes, uh, as really one conjoined uh, entirety, that the only way to live a good life was to live in a good society. Uh, and therefore, uh, good citizens formed a good society, and a good society, in Aristotle's uh, case, the polis, this, what we call the city-state, would form good citizens. And to achieve this, the city-state needs a good constitution, a good design of the laws and the rules of operation of the polis. And that's what uh, Aristotle's uh, work in uh, the politics is about, comparing the constitutions of uh, different city-states and uh, judging which of those constitutions is most conducive to eudaimonia. There were, of course, competing philosophies uh, they shared the emphasis on the virtues as being central for a thriving life. Uh, the Epicureans following uh, Epicurus uh, believed that a good life was achieved, especially uh, by freedom from anxiety and pain. Uh, and while the term Epicurean came to us today as a uh, meaning someone who uh, uh, has a highly refined tastes and uh, perhaps desires luxury, Epicurus meant almost the opposite. He said that uh, keeping uh, desires under strong self-control, moderation of pleasures, a simple life was the way to achieve well-being. So Epicurus and the Epicureans of ancient Greece were not Epicureans in the way we use the term today, but rather preachers of moderation, of desire. They emphasized virtues and they emphasized friendship as being essential. The Stoics, uh, another uh, school of uh, ancient Greek philosophy which gained its uh, 
dominant role during the Roman uh, Republic and Roman Empire uh, held that uh, a great part of well-being depended on the control of one's emotions and the acceptance of nature and of fate. Uh, so that's where our concept of uh, being stoic comes from. Uh, and the Stoics argued uh, in particular that the role of material goods should be minimized uh, because uh, fate may leave one poor, uh, and, uh, but even in poverty, with uh, an acceptance of that poverty and a control over emotions and an understanding of one's condition, it would still be possible to leave, lead a thriving life. Since Stoicism flourished especially uh, in the Roman period, which was not a period of civic participation by individuals uh, in setting uh, the laws as it had been in uh, Athens, uh, 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 for example, uh, the Stoics downplayed the role of active citizenship, uh, stewardship of the state, because such political outlets were not available. So Stoicism emphasized coping, uh, coping with circumstances, uh, the control of emotions by uh, our rational faculties, and the cultivation of virtues as the only real source of the good life. Fast forward 2000 years to Jeremy Bentham in the early 1800s, who was writing uh, for uh, the legislators, uh, arguing what kind of laws Britain should put on its books. And Bentham, argued similarly for a eudaimonic uh, orientation, uh, the greatest good for the greatest number, as it's sometimes summarized. But he took a very simple-minded view of what uh, thriving is, uh, far too simple-minded to actually uh, be uh, either workable or advisable. For Bentham, I uh, argued that there were only uh, two basic uh, motivations uh, of human beings, one to seek pleasure and the second to avoid pain. And in his uh, hedonic approach uh, or hedonistic approach, uh, happiness is the net balance of pleasure minus pain. And so Bentham argued that the laws of society, the constitution of the state, the rules of behavior should be to use the instruments of punishment and reward to produce the maximum excess of uh, net hedonic happiness, the maximum net balance of pleasure minus pain. And he thought of this in a very physicalist term uh, that one could actually measure for each individual pleasure and pain, uh, take the difference between the two, sum them up in society, uh, and then maximize the sum of the uh, net hedonic balance. And uh, this would be the utilitarian approach. Uh, it, it was so unwieldy and unworkable and such a vast oversimplification of what the good life is that it was uh, discarded in practical terms, I would say, uh, as an operational approach by the middle of the 19th century. But the basic idea that we should be promoting the greatest good for the greatest number with countless caveats remains a, 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 a prevalent idea today and not a bad one because it keeps our attention uh, as to what is the good 
and how it can be spread widely in society, even if Bentham's specific ideas of what the good is, uh, what constitutes the good uh, were uh, too uh, reductionist and, and uh, uh, narrow to be truly helpful. There are, of course, many non-eudaimonic approaches to the question of law, society, uh, politics, and economics. Uh, Kant can be interpreted in some ways uh, as uh, eudaimonic in orientation, uh, but the emphasis for Kant is on the rational imperatives to follow certain directions, the so-called deontological or duty bound or duty based approach rather than the happiness oriented approach. And of course, Kant put forward in several different variants, categorical imperatives uh, as the tests of whether uh, something was indeed a duty. And the categorical imperative uh, is defined in one of its uh, many variants uh, as uh, uh, adopting a maxim or a behavior uh, that can be generalized to be a universal maxim. So behaving according to a rule that could be a general principle. Uh, and for that, Kant argued that telling the truth, honoring contracts uh, and so forth are rational, duties uh, that uh, are irrespective of the happiness that they may bring. So Kant himself took pains to emphasize that he was not talking about well-being, he was talking about rational duty, though many modern philosophers think that Kant can be interpreted more fundamentally as promoting well-being through the adoption of the right kinds of duties. Uh, for uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, another approach, not eudaimonic, because Hobbes did not believe that it was possible to uh, have a good life. He did not believe that individuals could choose wisely or develop virtues. Thomas Hobbes believed that if left alone in a state of nature, there would be a war of all against all. And so uh, the best we could do is stop each other from killing by putting all of ourselves under the authority of a all powerful government, a Leviathan. Uh, there are many religious traditions that are non-eudaimonic, at least non-eudaimonic with respect to life on earth, though they may claim to be eudaimonic with respect to life ever last lasting. But I would say that uh, some Protestant uh, theology especially emphasizes not God's goodness uh, or God's uh, rational uh, uh, basis or a rational universe, but the inscrutability of God's will and the need of humans to subordinate themselves to God's will. So rather than uh, looking to uh, happiness, uh, the idea is to subordinate uh, to uh, uh, revelation and to uh, God's will, scrutable or inscrutable. Uh, and in a way, uh, Calvinism, I think, can uh, be interpreted in part uh, in this manner that uh, one follows one's calling, uh, whether one is uh, of the elect uh, and uh, will be saved or will be eternally damned is unknowable and not based on uh, rational principles, but on uh, God's uh, unlimited will. Uh, and so it's, I would say, a non-eudaimonic approach. Uh, and uh, uh, the Puritans who were Calvinists uh, have sometimes been defined as people who had the uh, ever-present fear that somehow, somewhere, somebody might be happy. Uh, and so uh, it, it, they have been interpreted as an anti-eudaimonic 
uh, philosophy as well. Do one's duty, don't expect happiness. Uh, yet another non-eudaimonic approach is libertarianism, uh, which defines the individual liberty as a natural and inalienable right so that society should be organized to maximize not happiness, but liberty. Though some libertarians would argue that because liberty is the key to happiness, that's really a eudaimonic approach. But I would say that libertarianism aims to maximize something different from happiness, and libertarians do not discuss happiness uh, very deeply. They discuss liberty and how it can be maximized according to their definition. Well, what is interesting for us is a modern breakthrough of the last 50 years that we're beginning to measure eudaimonia more systematically and uh, more uh, uh, insightfully than Bentham could ever have dreamed. Uh, Bentham and his followers imagined somehow one could measure pleasure and pain in a, mechanic, a mechanical way. And when that proved to be uh, impossible, th many economists and many uh, political scientists dropped the idea of eudaimonia as being an objective because they argued that it was unmeasurable. Uh, and that uh, one could not make comparisons across individuals in any event. And so the idea of maximizing well-being or attending to well-being was somewhat meaningless because well-being itself was so subjective and unmeasurable that there was no way that one could base public policy on the goal of promoting eudaimonia. But I think that this is much too pessimistic. And in recent times, psychologists have done a big favor for all of us in developing new tools for measuring well being, assessing it, and thereby enabling these measurements of well being to be used in a practical way to help design social institutions, not unlike Bentham hoped for, but not achieved. And the measure that uh, I tend to use uh, most together with my colleagues who uh, annually uh, publish the World Happiness Report is a particular measure of well being, which is a subjective well being measure, subjective in the sense that it comes from the report of each person about their lives. It's a measure called the Cantrill Ladder, defined after the psychologist Hadley Cantrill, who devised it. So here is the Cantrill Ladder, and I will let each of you uh, answer for yourselves the following question. Please imagine a ladder with steps uh, or rungs of the ladder from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. So the top rung of the ladder represents the best possible life for you. And the bottom rung of the ladder, rung zero, represents the worst possible life for you. So the question is, on which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel at this time? So take a moment and think of your life like a ladder with 10 rungs from zero to 10. You can, uh, you don't have to uh, report this, but you can think about where you would place your life on the ladder from the worst that you can imagine with the, whatever suffering, drudgery, poverty, destitution, enslavement, or however else you would imagine the bottom rung and the top rung, whatever you would imagine as the best possible life you could have, how you would evaluate your life. Well, this Cantra ladder is, uh, turns out to be quite informative. And it has now been uh, the basis of 
thousands of studies around the world. Uh, it has a community of researchers, not unlike the community of economists that study gross domestic product. There is a global happiness community which studies the responses to the Cantrell ladder question. And every year, Gallup, the survey company, samples a thousand people in 160 countries, asking them many questions, including the Cantrell ladder question. And then each year, my colleagues and I take the answers to the Gallup survey and we average them within each country and then rank the countries according to which rung of the ladder the average uh, countryman reports. And we get a picture of the world that looks something like this. The top rank uh, for 2020 uh, had an average uh, standing on the between the seventh and eighth rung of the ladder with an average score of 7.78. The countries at the bottom of the ladder expressing the uh, uh, close to the worst lives imaginable uh, were between the second and the third rung of the ladder on average with a score of 2.375. So in this map, the darker the green, the higher the rankings. It's a little hard for you to tell probably, but the very highest rankings are in Scandinavia, or actually not quite true, in the Nordic countries. And uh, let me distinguish, Scandinavian countries are Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. And the Nordic countries are the Scandinavian countries plus Finland and Iceland. So the Nordic countries rank near or at the top of the Cantrell ladder score. And you can see that uh, the countries uh, in tropical Africa uh, tend to rank uh, near the bottom uh, of uh, the uh, global ranking. We use this then to analyze what is it that determines these rankings? Is it the incomes of the countries? Is it the poverty rates? What kinds of differences across these countries help to account for the differences in the reported subjective well-being across the countries? So here are the top 19 countries uh, for the three-year average of the 2018 to 2020 surveys. Uh, and uh, this was just reported in uh, this year's uh, World Happiness Report, uh, which was uh, issued in March on March 20th of this year. I know it's March 20th because March 20th every year now under a UN resolution is World Happiness Day. So on World Happiness Day, we release the World Happiness Report. And the highest ranking country in the world uh, in terms of <coughs> the latter uh, score is Finland, followed by Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Netherlands, Norway, and then down 160 <coughs> countries in total. But quite remarkably, of the first seven countries, five of them are the Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Something's going on there that is rather impressive, uh, unless they're all being told, give Gallup a high score. Uh, something uh, is happening in the Nordic countries that promotes a, a sense of well being that leads the people to answer that their lives are as close to the optimum as in any country in the world. And the only two non-Nordic countries of the top seven are Switzerland and the Netherlands, which are two Western European countries not far from the Nordic countries uh, uh, and uh, quite 
remarkably, the top eight countries are in Europe. Uh, most of the top 20 are in Europe. On this score, the United States uh, ranks 19th in the world. Not terrible, uh, but quite uh, distinctly lower than uh, Finland. Now, when we do this ranking, we then use uh, multivariate regression analysis to try to understand which differences across the countries leads to these different reported outcomes. If it's just national culture, some countries are happy and others sad, we wouldn't find objective measures playing much of a role in explaining the cross-country differences. But in fact, we find a set of measures highly explanatory of the cross-country variables when we make a so-called panel regression or a cross-section, cross-national time series regression of the uh, Cantrell ladder scores. So what is it that matters in explaining why Finland is on top, for example? It turns out that these uh, uh, explanatory variables are those that I show on the right of uh, the slide. The income per capita matters. Countries that are higher income tend to be uh, happier. Aristotle is right in this. The Stoics uh, are not descriptive of reported well-being, though they might argue that they're right in their advice to the poor, but uh, descriptively higher income per capita helps to explain the differences across countries, but not as much as one would think. There's a lot more going on than simply wealth and poverty. A second determinant is health, measured here as life expectancy or healthy life years, which adjusts life expectancy for uh, diseases which impair the quality of life without uh, reducing life expectancy. A third kind of variable that consistently helps to account for cross-country differences is the degree of social support in the society. How do you measure that? <clears throat> Again, subjectively, individuals are asked in the survey, do you have someone that you can rely on in the case of need? People in isolation, lonely people may answer no. People who have a social support network, family and friends and colleagues would answer yes. In places that report social connectedness, happiness is higher. This is another Aristotelian idea that uh, Aristotle noted that friendship, along with income or material well being, are constitutive of eudaimonia. A fourth variable is the subjective sense of freedom to make important life decisions. Uh, this is interesting. Psychologically, whether it's an objective measure or not, people are asked whether they believe that they have a freedom to make important decisions in their lives. And this may involve the question whether they feel they have uh, barriers uh, because of culture, or being a minority, or being a woman, uh, or being poor, or some other reason, or lack of uh, political and civil rights lacking the freedom. And it turns out that places that report a higher subjective sense of freedom also report higher well being. A fifth kind of variable labeled here generosity is a, a measure of the extent to which people in the country engage in voluntary giving, in philanthropy, in donations, in charity, in volunteerism. 
And there are different kinds of questions that uh, educe the attitudes towards uh, giving and sharing and places that indicate a higher level of generosity are also happier places. The sixth uh, explanatory variable that we find to be consistently important is the perception of corruption or lack of corruption in government and in the business sector. People are less happy living in countries that they deem to be corrupt uh, governments. Uh, so places where the government is disdained or is believed to be corrupt uh, causes a, a more general unhappiness in the society. If you take the, and then the final is a, an unexplained residual, uh, but if you take these variables together, the idea is that a good life has several different kinds of determinants. The quality of governance, the social support systems, the income levels, the values, uh, the sense of freedom in society. And by looking at the relationship between the measured well-being and the determinants of that well-being, I think we gain important insights into the kinds of societies that can achieve the Aristotelian uh, or Benthamite goal of promoting well-being in the society. So Aristotle started us off with his theories of what would be conducive to well-being. And I think he made uh, a lot of uh, uh, invaluable and lasting contributions showing that it is a combination of factors, individual character, uh, material conditions, social networks, political environment, all of which together contribute to a thriving life. In the last uh, 50 years, many psychologists have turned to the question not only of how to measure well being, but to ask at both the, especially at the individual level, what is it that leads an individual to report, uh, or to put it a different way, what leads to an individual's uh, high level of life satisfaction? And perhaps the most famous of these theories now a half century old, uh, it was by a so-called humanist psychologist named Maslow, who defined a series of needs of individuals, of each of us, to live a thriving life. And he created the so-called hierarchy of needs, or conceptualized, I should say, a hierarchy of needs. At the base of the hierarchy are the physiological needs. Uh, enough food to eat, water, warmth, rest, and so forth. At the next level are the needs for safety and security. Uh, otherwise, uh, one lives not only in harm's way, but also with high anxiety and stress. Uh, then he identified at the third uh, base of this pyramid, uh, the social needs, which uh, Aristotle emphasized, belonging, intimate relations, and friends. Then he emphasized the uh, need of feeling esteem, self-esteem, a feeling of accomplishment, a desire for respect from others in the society, perhaps a uh, grounded in the very real evolutionary sense that ostracism constitutes a kind of death uh, or raises the chance of death. So uh, prestige and reputation among one's peers is a basic uh, source of uh, well-being uh, and a basic human need. And then at the top of Maslow's 
hierarchy of needs. Uh, he claimed that self-fulfillment, uh, self-actualization, uh, excellence uh, of skills, of the arts, uh, of a profession, uh, of creativity, were part of uh, the uh, uh, way to uh, achieve uh, a good life. And Maslow's hierarchy says that to get to that top level of self-fulfillment, one needs to have a strong base to meet the material needs, the security needs, the friendships and relationships, the respect within society, uh, and then that enables self-actualization. Another variant like this is uh, the new field called positive psychology uh, that was started uh, by two psychologists, uh, Martin Seligman at the uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, and Ed Diener at University of Illinois. Uh, Martin Seligman uh, has put forward uh, an acronym PERMA as his theory of the constitutive factors of uh, a good life. Uh, so this is uh, positive feelings, engagement in <coughs> activities or finding the flow, uh, as is sometimes said, strong relationships, meaning in, or purpose uh, of life and achievement or a sense of uh, excellence. You can see that PERMA and the Maslow hierarchy have a, a certain congruence. They're not the same. Uh, PERMA is also not a pyramid uh, with a base uh, upon which one builds. And you can see that these uh, various dimensions uh, of uh, a good life very much uh, hark back to Aristotle's concepts uh, of a good life uh, presented in the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, though I would say that for Aristotle, while he talked about these various dimensions, there was more emphasis perhaps uh, not on the conditions of life, but on the cultivation of character uh, and the determination of virtue, both at, as an individual's own quest and as a societal, uh, uh, a societal result uh, than is in either Maslow's theory or Seligman's approach. But this multidimensional idea uh, that well-being depends on many different kinds of needs being met, individual, economic, social, political, uh, and psychological, I think is a very helpful starting point. And while we can't really nail down one compelling uh, theory uh, that uh, dismisses all the others, the differences across the theories, I think, are uh, less substantial for our purposes than the similarities and the emphasis on this broad, multidimensional framework. So most theories share the view that happiness depends on material conditions, social connections, good governance, a sense of freedom, the ability to cope mentally, uh, like the Stoics uh, emphasized, self-control, mood control, mindfulness, coping strategies. And I would emphasize very strongly in the Aristotelian uh, direction education as crucial, that nobody uh, has a natural ability for happiness. It, for all of us, we must cultivate our capacity to have a good life and to have that sense of thriving and that uh, education in various ways, in our practice, in our wisdom, in our judgment, and in our formal pedagogy, all play an important role in this. Uh, let me uh, talk about one specific variant of this. Uh, economists use the term uh, utility, of course, 
uh, as the shorthand for well-being. They generally put income or consumption goods in the utility function, but uh, utility we've just seen or thriving has many, many different dimensions. But the modern utilitarian framework says in some way that uh, social welfare or what's called the social welfare function, SWF, is in some sense a sum of the well-being of the members of the society. In some sense, this is a good idea because it says that uh, the goals of society are the well-being of its members, though the nature of that well-being is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon. And uh, modern utilitarians tend to be rule based utilitarians rather than act utilitarians. The distinction is that uh, a rule-based utilitarian is not concerned so much with particular actions or decisions, but rather what kinds of rules should society have? What kinds of laws, what kinds of constitutions that are most conducive to maximizing social welfare that in some sense is something like the sum of the welfare of individual members. Now, there's one particular point that I want to emphasize uh, in uh, this, and that is uh, the diminishing marginal utility of income. The point is the following. Uh, so I think in line with Aristotle and in line with our evidence, more income generally raises happiness. We can say that higher income is correlated with a higher rung of the ladder in the Cantrell ladder scores. So higher income raises a measure of well-being or life satisfaction. And the extent to which an extra thousand dollars a year raises the uh, utility or happiness or Cantrell ladder score could be called the marginal utility of income. It's the gain of utility from an increment of income. The hypothesis that is empirically borne out is that the marginal utility of income is positive. Like Aristotle said, <laughs> more money is better. Don't throw it away. But the gain of added income diminishes at higher incomes. So an extra $1,000 a year means a lot to an individual in destitution at uh, $1,000 a year income, it doubles the income and may lead to enough to eat. Whereas an extra $1,000 a year for somebody who already is earning a million dollars a year is incidental and would not raise income, or I'm sorry, utility, if at all, by very much. And so the idea, therefore, is that the marginal utility of income is positive, but diminishing, meaning that the added gains to happiness for that comes from added income diminishes the higher is the income level. It just doesn't matter so much to have an incremental $1,000 at higher levels of income. To the extent that one is then utilitarian in focus, this tends to argue for egalitarianism or for redistribution, because it says that the extra $1,000 to Bill Gates doesn't mean very much, but the extra $1,000 to someone starving means a lot. Saving a life ending suffering. And so Bill Gates is a good example of someone who has so far given away about $50 billion of his wealth. He's so good at making it that his wealth keeps increasing even as he gives it away. But the idea that transferring income or wealth from him to the destitute uh, raises overall social welfare is an implication of 
the diminishing marginal utility of income. On some theories, the idea would be to get to full equality, because if everybody has the same utility function with declining marginal utility of income, and if the uh, if income redistribution is easy to do and without additional costs, then transferring money from richer to poorer people raises total well-being. But in general, going to full equality is not such a good idea in practice, because where it has been tried has led to a tremendous uh, 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 interventions by government in people's lives uh, to so much meddling in order to keep equality that personal freedom uh, has uh, been deeply impaired, if not eliminated in the case of extremes uh, such as uh, Soviet style central planning. And as well, if one takes away income from wealthier individuals, uh, that can impair their incentives to work hard and to make effort. Similarly, if uh, one receives income, no matter what, uh, whether an individual is making an effort or not, that can impair incentives of the receiver as well as the giver. And so generally, the lesson of diminishing marginal utility of income is towards a partial egalitarianism to prevent destitution, to tax the very rich, but not to aim for a full equality of income. Now, different societies have adopted different institutions and the market economies of the United States, Canada, Britain, uh, Sweden, France, Germany, Italy, and so on, have different variations of capitalism, different variations of market economy. They treat economic needs in a different way. The United States, not so generous to the poor. Sweden, much more generous to the poor. Different societies have different tolerances of inequality. The United States has had very high inequality throughout its history along racial lines, as well as along class lines. Uh, whereas uh, countries uh, in Northern Europe tend to have much lower rates of inequality, the Gini coefficient, as we looked at earlier. Uh, different countries uh, have different rules for public versus private consumption. For example, in the United States, housing is largely a private, privately determined activity. Healthcare goes with the job, not with citizenship. Uh, paying for your schooling generally goes with you, not with the government, and so on. Whereas in other capitalist countries, the public sector provides for the health care out of general revenues or provides for tuition out of general revenues uh, and so forth. So countries differ in that way. And countries differ in how working conditions are determined. The United States has very low rates of unionization. We have laws that make union organizing more difficult. Uh, and in Sweden, uh, for example, union coverage of workers is more than half of the workforce. I, I believe if I'm up to date, it's probably still well more than half. Whereas in the United States, it's now uh, around 6% of the private sector workers. And uh, there was just a, an election uh, attempting to form a union in uh, an Amazon uh, warehouse in Alabama that where the vote failed. So working conditions in the US are very much determined at the enterprise level, whereas in other societies, other capitalist societies, they're determined at the governmental level. So this leads to categorization of different kinds of capitalisms, and we can study which of these is more conducive to well-being. In a famous book in 1990, 
uh, a Swedish uh, social scientist, uh, Gosta Esping Andersen, uh, argued that there were three kinds of capitalism. The relatively free market capitalism of the English speaking countries, Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, UK, and US, with Switzerland being partly in that mix. Then uh, what he categorized as conservative uh, societies where there's a social welfare state to support family life uh, in particular, uh, where he put Finland, though I think as of today, I would definitely put Finland in the social democratic column, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and also partly Switzerland. And then what he called the social democracies, what I have characterized as the Nordic countries primarily, uh, but also including Austria and the Netherlands. And I would say strongly today, Finland, which is governed by a social democratic party. He called Anglo-Saxon style capitalism liberal. In the United States by liberal, we mean left of center in politics, more state oriented, but liberal, of course, in the European sense means liberty oriented or more free market. And that's the sense in which Esping Anderson uh, considered it. So I describe, uh, and you can read in detail, these different uh, kinds of capitalism. And we can look at how our happiness scores relate. And I've done that in this way by showing you the social democratic countries are in red, what Ghosting uh, uh, Anderson uh, calls the uh, conservative countries are in green, and the liberal or Anglo-Saxon countries uh, are in blue. Switzerland is uh, should be purple. Switzerland, by the way, is C-H-E uh, in this code, uh, Helvetia, uh, and uh, the others, I think, are uh, uh, intelligible to you. Uh, so the highest Cantra ladder score uh, for this sample of countries uh, goes uh, Finland, Switzerland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, New Zealand, uh, Austria, D DEU is uh, Deutschland or Germany, Canada, Ireland, Great Britain, United Kingdom, that is, USA, Belgium, France, Italy, and Japan. Uh, and what you can see here is that the social democracies tend to be the countries at the highest end of the well being. They're the ones in red. The liberal countries, interestingly, are in the middle. And the conservative welfare states tend to be lower. So there's a lesson here to be studied more deeply. My takeaway is that the social democracies or the Nordic countries come out at the highest of the happiness ranking, and they have a distinctive form of capitalism. Uh, this is also true if we look at the Gini coefficient. Again, the red countries, the social democracies tend to have the lowest level of inequality. The liberal or Anglo-Saxon English speaking countries tend to have the highest level of inequality and the conservative countries somewhere in the middle. So social democracy reduces inequality, meets economic needs, and tends to produce the highest level of well-being or eudaimonia. There was a claim, a famous claim, by uh, the economist Friedrich Hayek, uh, who uh, was a, an Austrian economist uh, who began his work in the 1920s. He came to England in the 1930s and taught at the London School of Economics. Uh, he wrote a famous book in 1945 called The Road to Serfdom. Then he came to teach at University of Chicago and he later won a Nobel Prize for Economic Science. And he wrote a famous book in 1945 called The Road to Serfdom, where he claimed that uh, we should avoid the social democracy type systems because they would lead to a loss of 
democracy. Uh, so his claim was a kind of uh, causation that if the government is too large and intervening, democracy will suffer as a result. Uh, it's a complicated story with Hayek because initially his object of attack was not social welfare spending, but socialism of big industry. He was very much against state ownership of industry. But by the 1960s, he became an opponent of the social welfare state, as in Scandinavian or Nordic social democracy. I want to emphasize that that was a hypothesis of Hayek in 1945 that was proved to be wrong. Because it turned out that if I did the ranking, which I did not do, of uh, the quality of democratic institutions for these different varieties of capitalism, the strongest democracies with the lowest corruption and the most legitimacy are actually the social democratic countries, contrary to Hayek's claim. They did not lead to a road to serfdom to totalitarian or authoritarian states. They led to a stronger democracy. No, it goes to 115. Uh, let me finish uh, with a couple of further ideas to close this off. I've talked a lot about well being. Let me talk about suffering uh, on the other end of the spectrum. There is a lot of evidence, uh, especially uh, produced by child psychologists uh, and uh, pediatri uh, pediatricians uh, in the last uh, 30 years that uh, the quality of upbringing in early years is not only uh, a determinant of well-being in those years, but can set a lifetime path for the individual. And uh, especially the idea that a, a hostile, dangerous, noisy, threatening, stress-filled environment can lead to permanent uh, physiological changes in the child that last throughout a lifetime and in the brain as a result of this uh, is uh, an idea of uh, with significant scientific support. And this is summarized as a toxic stress syndrome, that if a young child is in an environment of stress, hunger, danger, uh, loud noises, physical lack of safety, lack of parental love, and so forth, then the uh, stress sin uh, systems of the body, uh, the release of uh, the hormone cortisol uh, and the various uh, um, components of the stress system in the brain and body uh, and rest of the body uh, lead to permanent or can lead to permanent impairment and physiological damage. The point of this is to say that another key to happiness, we now understand much better, <laughs> is the quality of early childhood, especially and including safe pregnancy, even the health of the mother before pregnancy for what are called epigenetic reasons, but safe pregnancy, safe childbirth, safe early environment, uh, protection from disease, adequate nutrition, especially for brain development, and uh, the lack of chronic stress are all important for the individual to be able to achieve a quality of life throughout lifetime. Final point uh, is that in addition to the objective conditions that I've been emphasizing uh, of uh, material conditions, healthfulness, social support, quality of governance, uh, physical uh, conditions of early childhood development is the healthy brain and the healthy mind. 
And the idea of psychologists today increasingly is tapping into other ancient traditions, especially Buddhist traditions, uh, of the importance of psychological training. For example, mindfulness practices or meditation practices to create uh, attributes of the mind that are conducive to well being. Uh, in other words, uh, even uh, along the lines of Stoic ideas that uh, appropriate control over emotions uh, can be trained, uh, not just to uh, be characteristics of an individual's personality. So I've uh, assigned a, <coughs> or given a paper for this week also uh, of a very uh, fascinating reading of how psychological training can add to well-being, and the idea is that there are four categories that uh, the psychologists focus on: improved awareness through mindfulness practices, including mindfulness uh, forms of meditation, connectedness with others, including uh, kindness and compassion forms of meditation and other compassion training, insightfulness support through psychotherapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, and training for purpose in life through a variety of purpose-based interventions and education that imparts the ideas of purpose in life. Finally, finally, let me say that a compelling uh, approach uh, to all of uh, this, in my view, is the combination of human rights and education as fundamental bases for good lives. Because human rights, which are recognized to be universal in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and based on universal human dignity, call for ensuring that all individuals have the economic, civil, political, social, and cultural support for a good life. These rights should give rise to responsibilities, which unfortunately the Universal Declaration of Human Rights doesn't yet enunciate. For example, paying taxes in order to ensure that poor people can have all of their economic rights met. And I would add that education and cultivation of virtues and cultivation of mindfulness and healthy minds is essential as a complement to human rights. So this uh, brings us to the end of uh, the time. Uh, I think the bottom line is we can measure well being in a variety of important ways. We can begin to assess how to promote that well being in ways that Aristotle and Plato dreamt of that Bentham uh, began to argue for and that now uh, is much more practical than before, and that we can understand thriving lives uh, as a uh, multi-dimensional uh, challenge which goes well beyond income to include healthy societies, good governance, uh, and uh, healthy minds for all. So thank you very much. We will pick up uh, here on Friday. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.